my first love isn't atheism. It's not that like I'm just, you know, so excited about not believing in God. It's that when I was in College Station, I was at Texas A&M and I had all these ideas for tech startup ideas that I wanted to, you know, do that I wanted to implement that, you know, and I would go to coffee shops and I'd be like, just looking around me, like, where are all the other developers? Where are all the other people who are excited about, you know, changing the world and stuff. And there's like, there was nothing. There was no, like, I had to, to go and seek out startup groups. And even then it's like a bunch of old people who are maybe doing like real estate investing or something. Yeah. And I was, I was frustrated because I saw what was going on in other countries, in places that were a little bit more liberal minded, places like Silicon Valley. And I saw entrepreneurs that were literally changing the world and almost all of them were atheists. You had people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, who I, I know Zuckerberg has kind of flip-flopped a little bit, but at least they said like, I'm agnostic or I'm, you know, Zuckerberg I think is like some weird secular kind of, believes in God and like almost, I don't even know, but pretty much all of them, like these aren't fundamentalist religious Christians. These are people who like, they're trying to save the world for humanity because they're humanists, because they care about the future of humanity, you know? And so I just found myself yearning for more of this to be surrounded with more people like that. And I couldn't find them. And so I'd go to coffee shops and I'd just hear people like sitting down having Bible studies, Jesus, Jesus, God, God. And it's all talking about this stuff that's complete bullshit and that is demonstrable bullshit. And it's just, it, it would start to, to like get under my skin. And I got to the point where like, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I was like, why is no one talking about this stuff? So yeah. I started making videos, debunking it, showing the science behind it, showing how science works. And what I found was that there were a lot of people who were not only frustrated like me, but there were also a lot of people who this was new to them. Like they'd never even heard this stuff before. And so for someone to kind of get on, you know, YouTube and just start talking about, I know that there's other channels that do this too. I'm not the only one, but to many of them, like I was kind of their introduction to it. And they started realizing that oh my God, this stuff that I've never questioned, like, why do I believe that? Like, why do I actually buy into it? Like, what if there is an alternative that's actually true and this isn't? And I, I think that a lot of people are slowly starting to wake up, but we have our road cut out for us. We have a lot of work left to do. What, in short, why do people believe ancient literature that asserts claims that aren't evidently true? Well, the older it is, the harder it is to disprove, for one. So if you look back at, you know, Mormonism, there's right now there's, there's a growing, um, you know, a growing number of Mormons, but most of us can look at it and be like, oh, come on. Like Joseph Smith is obviously a con man. Like you just a Google search of his name or watch an episode of South Park or something like, you know, it's, but that's a newer religion. You look even closer to modern day. You look at something like Scientology. And yeah, there's, there's a few followers here and there, and they use some different manipulation tactics. It's a cult that they're trying to pull people in, but you look at Scientology and it's like, it's even more obvious that it's a cult. You look at, um, people who like Satya Sai Baba, he was like an Indian guru who, you know, apparently could do miracles and pull pellets of, you know, uh, dust or smoke or ash or something from thin air and predicted his own death, got it wrong. We've got it like all on videotape. We got people debunking it. He doesn't even merit like an hour on the discovery channel because it's so obviously fake. And yet this is a guy who he allegedly was doing all these miracles, but you push it back 2000 years and you can't prove that mm -hmm. you have, Oh, well you've got all these eyewitness testimonies. Well, there's eyewitness people, testimonies who think that they saw aliens that think that they saw Bigfoot and Elvis and the Loch Ness monster and all this other stuff. But we don't take that seriously. But you push it back 2,000 years, it's like, oh, well, I heard that someone was willing to die for it. We don't have firsthand accounts. We have, you know, books from anonymous authors, you know, even by biblical scholars, you know, say, oh, it wasn't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And our earliest full gospels come quite a bit after the death of Christ. The earliest tiny little fragments are like 50 years after the death of Christ. But all of a sudden it's believable because it's 2000 years ago and somebody said it and it's been passed down from generation to generation and so heavily ingrained in us. We're taught from the time that before we develop critical thinking skills, before our prefrontal cortex is even fully formed, and we're, we're pushing that and indoctrinating that into our children, of course they're going to grow up thinking that that's the way that the world works if that's all that they know and if no one's stopping to question it but just the fact that a lot of people believe it doesn't make it true there's a lot of people that believe islam there's a lot of people that believe hinduism they can't all be right 
I don't. Okay. So just speaking to my own communities, I'm sure we all have our own religious communities that we come from if we do. And it's astounding to me as I traveled around the world a little bit to other countries and, and I would look at the host nation that I was in and I would see all their people. And, you know, maybe I'd be on a hill or a mountain just looking down because that somehow makes the, makes the sense of what you're experiencing a little bit more profound. Right. And I'm thinking none of these people believe what I believe. I'm a former Christian. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how do, how do you convince them? How do you, how do you tell everybody? And, and they've got their own thing going, wait a minute. They believe the same way that I believe. And it's just based off of belief. So what makes that different? And mm. it's amazing to me that that doesn't actually go through the mind of many of us. In fact, I think we're often encouraged not to scrutinize our ideas. And, um, but you are now producing a series called The Story of Life. What is that specifically about? What's, what's the purpose of that series? What are you accomplishing here? I've wanted to make this series since before I started my channel, started making videos, even maybe while kind of while I was still a Christian, I wanted mm. to, when I was still a Christian, I wanted to do it from the opposite viewpoint where it was like, man, there's all these people that they don't believe in god and they believe in evolution and i'm gonna set out to prove to them to show them that they're wrong i'm gonna make a video and it's gonna you know show all the evidence for god and stuff and it was kind of in the back of my head i didn't know if i would ever actually do it but like i just started kind of researching just for fun and as i dove into the science then i realized that was wrong but once i became an atheist i was like i think that the biggest steps for me in accepting evolution and abiogenesis and the big bang theory and whatnot was understanding how it worked. And I think there are so many people that just think that science operates the same way that religious dogma does, where there's a scientific establishment and they say that this is fact and you don't question it. And in all actuality, it's the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. In the scientific world, you win Nobel prizes if you're able to disprove the consensus, but you have to be able to demonstrate the evidence. You have to be able to set up a hypothesis that's disprovable, and then you try to disprove it. You don't try to prove it right, you try to prove it wrong. You test it and you see what are all the different ways that the data could be interpreted. Now let's test all those different ways and try to disprove and falsify them and see what's left over. And the more evidence that you have behind certain ideas and the more that you have disproving other ones, you start to kind of get a better idea of the truth and you start to kind of shape this, this idea. So the more that I dove into it, I started realizing that there's not only a lot of evidence behind this, but there's a lot of experiments that have been done. There's a lot of puzzle pieces that we put together. And when a scientist says, we don't know where life or how life got here, they're not saying we don't have the slightest clue. They're saying, mm -hmm. We actually have a number of competing hypotheses and there is a ton of evidence. We know that we're here and we know a lot of these steps along the way, but there's a few little gaps here and there that we're still trying to kind of figure out. But you don't have to have the entire puzzle to get a pretty good idea of what the picture's of if you're missing just a few pieces. You know, if you've got a puzzle that's like a puzzle of a dragon and you're missing like one piece in the corner, you're not going to say, oh, well, that's a picture of a boat. You know, like <laughs> you have a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you have a pretty good idea of the overall picture, even if you're like, well, I'm not exactly sure what goes right there in the corner, you know, and that's kind of what we're looking at here is that, you know, we, we know that like, we're all made of chemicals, we can examine our, you know, ourselves under, you know, electron microscopes, and we can, you know, figure out what we're made of and like mass spectrometers and stuff. And we can, can look at, you know, how our cells work and what all they're composed of and stuff. And we can compare that to other organisms, we can sequence the DNA and see, you know, how similar we are to other uh, animals and plants on Earth. We can compare, you know, the anatomy and the structures of us and all these other animals. We can look back through the geological plates and stuff and trace it back through time and see, like, you know, where did certain organisms die off? Where did they, you know, kind of uh, emerge and evolve? You know, how similar are they? We can date that radiometrically and we, we can take all these different lines of evidence. And then we can start looking all the way back at the very beginning and be like, before this point, there's no fossils. Before at this point, there's no chemical signatures for life whatsoever. And, at, you know, so we can kind of get back to the earliest life forms and the earliest fossils and the earliest signs of life and then be like, well, what was before that? Okay, well, we can kind of get a, an idea of what the chemical atmosphere of the early Earth looked like um, by, you know, 
know, analyzing some of these ancient rocks and what's inside of them and stuff. We can, you know, study outer space and different, um, like what chemicals are common throughout outer space on early planets that are forming through, you know, accretion and whatnot, um, through like spectrographs. We can start gathering all these little bits of evidence and then be like, okay, well, if the early earth was composed of, you know, these chemicals, then is it possible to get from those chemicals to life. And so they'll set up these experiments that, you know, they'll they'll be in a very sterile environment where they just make it like exactly like the early earth without any of the other stuff that we have around us today because that wouldn't exist back then. You know, life wouldn't have existed before life existed. I know that, you know, sounds yeah. obvious, but so then you you can start with those simulations and start watching and seeing what happens on its own. If I don't interfere with it, if I'm not, you know, trying to alter it or change it in any way, if I just set it up like a normal experiment where it's just let it run, what happens? And they've done experiments where they'll simulate the water cycle, they'll simulate lightning, they'll simulate volcanic activity, they'll simulate uh, meteor impacts. And in all of these situations, they start seeing, you know, the rise of amino acids, the rise of nucleic acids, uh, fatty acids forming on like montmorillonite clay and like all these building blocks for life. Like that's not life by itself. But those are the building blocks that will then make proteins and DNA and RNA and um, the you know fatty acid membranes, which then you know you have all this together, it can start to evolve and you can start to get phospholipid bilayers and stuff, and you start seeing it all come together just on its own. <laughs>